Hi, my name is Roger McFarlane, and uh, I'm a professor in classical studies at Brigham Young University. Uh, I'm excited to talk uh, in this next little bit about uh, the dark side of Vesuvius, archaeological excavation on Vesuvius's north slope. Got a map here uh, that's important to bear in mind. This is an image from uh, Barrington's uh, Atlas of the Ancient World. If you look kind of in the center, there is a, a, a red and orange spot which indicates the location of Mount Vesuvius. South and east of Vesuvius's center in this map which uh, reflects the landscape in antiquity, south and east is Pompeii and straight west, maybe a little bit south of west, is uh, the spot of Herculaneum. I'm very interested in Herculaneum and have given a couple of other talks about Herculaneum in, and, and Pompeii in this lecture series. Uh, this is kind of a pixelated picture. It shows Mount Vesuvius sort of a, 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 as a weather map might project it to going towards the south and east in the eruption of Vesuvius in 79 AD, a large amount, a gigantic amount of ash fell south and east upon the city of Pompeii, farther out, uh, indicating the direction of the, of the jet stream that day uh, when in August of 79, if it was in August, uh, that, the, uh, that the volcano erupted. Herculaneum suffered different damage due to pyroclastic surges Bearing this in mind, Pompeii, Herculaneum, their location in respect to Mount Vesuvius uh, will help you understand the geography of portions coming up later in this presentation. This slide shows fairly current uh, representation of the location of the Villa of the Papyri uh, at Herculaneum, just north of Herculaneum, just outside the city uh, itself of Herculaneum. Off on the left in the distance, uh, you might be able to see under a canopy there uh, an archaeological building feature, which is a portion of the Villa of the Papyri. What's most uh, important in this image is the amount of pyroclastic fill, that volcanic matrix, all that material that goes from the water level at the front up to the school on the top there against the skyline, a depth of about 20 meters, 62, 65 feet of volcanic material that came down mostly in the eruption of 79 upon the, uh, the town of Herculaneum. This building, which was depicted in the foreground in that last shot, a bath complex near the Villa of the Papyri, shows at its back the height of that volcanic fill that came down in an instant upon the inhabitants and uh, the town of Herculaneum. In recent years, uh, some excavation has happened against the walls or into the walls of that volcanic fill. Uh, this uh, lovely relief plaque, which is shown here in this slide, has come out of the excavations, the more recent excavations in the last decade or so. This head was uh, discovered in the late 1990s near the Villa of the Papyri. And if you look very closely, you can see traces of paint on the eyes and in the hair of this Amazon bust. Uh, this lovely piece of art uh, came out of the volcanic matrix. Uh, that's all at Herculaneum. This exhibit here at the Leonardo, which we're surrounded by here, has primarily artifacts from Pompeii. Uh, Pompeii, remember, suffered differently as the ash fall accumulated on top of the buildings and inhabitants of Pompeii. Um, showing again the slide uh, with the relative positions of Herculaneum and Pompeii. Uh, but still, we're talking about the north side of Vesuvius primarily in today's talk. And uh, this photograph will help you start thinking around to the other side of the volcano. This photograph taken in 1944, when the Allies were marching up from the south along the uh, Italian peninsula, Vesuvius happened to be erupting. Therefore, a lot of dramatic photographs were taken in that time period. Uh, from our perspective, if you look at this image, 
uh, Herculaneum would be sort of directly between us and the cone of the volcano and Pompeii around to the south. So this is taken from uh, the northwest and there's a plume of smoke going up full of ash and, and other debris out of the core of the volcano. When we talk about the north slope of the, of the volcano, well, we're talking about the, the area that's over to the left that's sort of protected underneath that cloud that's spilling down gently uh, over the north slope of the volcano. This aerial photo will help explain as well. The first site that I'm going to talk about in, uh, in the remainder of my presentation is indicated by that red dot uh, on the map you see for Soma Vesuviana. The black dot in the middle, of course, is the cone of the volcano. And Naples, Napoli is over to the, the west and north. Ercolano and Pompeii are shown there, and Nola is thrown in for reference. Um, I'd like you to note the, uh, the geological crest between the cone of the volcano and Soma Vesuviana. Soma Vesuviana is a modern township in, uh, in Campania, in the greater Naples area. That crest, that geological crest, uh, has a name. It's called uh, Monte Soma, uh, and Soma Vesuviana is named after that crest. The crest plays an important role geologically. This map, it's a road map showing the freeways in black and so forth uh, to give you an idea that Naples is a busy, thriving, surging metropolis. But Vesuvius in that road map is green because it is steep and uh, is forested and so on and so forth. Okay, this um, image is thrown in to help you understand the effects of Monte Soma. Monte Soma, the, uh, that crest on the north side of the Vesuvius complex, um, was probably formed in the eruption of uh, 79 AD. Now, I'm not a geological specialist, um, but it's my understanding that the volcano uh, in 79 blew out more on the south and east side uh, than it did on the north side. And this image shows the effects of the blasting of the volcano in 79 less on the north more on the south, the more scarce blasts on the north side, shown in the red and yellow, are both caused by and due to the, uh, the retention of Monte Soma. This highly detailed map from colleagues at Pisa, the geological map of Vesuvius, shows all of the known eruptions of Vesuvius volcanologically depicted that have occurred over thousands and thousands of years. So in different color codings here on this map, uh, representations of the big eruption in 79 AD, eruptions in the 17th century, prehistoric eruptions, all that is depicted. And you'll see that there is more volcanic activity on the south side of Vesuvius than there is on the north side, but in the sort of olive and sort of bright greenish blue on the north side of Vesuvius, extending out towards Monte Soma, there is some volcanic activity. So I've titled my talk The Dark Side of Vesuvius because we know a lot more about what has occurred historically uh, and also uh, geologically, volcanologically, uh, on the south side of the mountain, then we know about what's happened on the north side of the mountain. I want to talk about two sites uh, that have been excavated on the north side of Vesuvius, and I've introduced Soma Vesuviana already. So let me introduce you to a building and an excavation uh, that has occurred over the past 30 years or so. If we go back, we could, we could, we could date its beginnings to 1935. There was a farmer uh, who owned this plot of land, and he was bothered by a wall that he had on his property 
Uh, you can see it depicted uh, down towards the bottom of this wall uh, where the brickwork is different. He was bothered that it was there and started to dig down to the base of the wall so he could remove it. However, couldn't get to the bottom of the wall because it went down a good long way. As it turns out, uh, the wall that was causing this landowner problems was actually of antique origin and had never really gone away. Well, there were uh, there are historical accounts from um, Suetonius, first century AD historian, and uh, Tacitus, the great historian from the early second century AD, who talk about the place where Augustus, arguably the first Roman emperor, died. Augustus was famously born and famously he died in the same house, uh, according to Suetonius. Suetonius says, that place was Aphud Nolam, in Latin, near Nola. Nola is the most prominent town, you may have seen it a couple of slides ago, the most prominent Roman town in that part of Campania. And it was rumored and believed that perhaps the house where Augustus was born, the house where Augustus died, might be locatable. Well, rumors began to stir when the depth of this wall could not be probed fully, um, and people uh, came to believe that perhaps this might be the place where um, Augustus uh, lived and died. To cut the long story short, this slide uh, was taken a few years ago, I believe this is about 2005, of the same site. As you can see, there's more here to be discovered than simply one wall. And this shot was taken a little bit later. Colleagues from the University of Tokyo have been excavating this site for a number of years, the site at Soma Vesuviana. This facade here uh, shows uh, the ancient Roman pediment, the triangular architectural piece attached to the front of a large brick wall and then the gray material that's sort of surging through the doorway out towards you it's not moving now because it's hardened uh, tufa that's volcanic fill that came from Vesuvius came from uphill on Vesuvius down into this site probably at the beginning of the sixth century AD but possibly at the uh, at the end of the 5th century AD. As archaeologists, uh, excavators uh, went into this site, occasionally they would find things in that volcanic fill uh, associated with this building. This statue began to appear from the, uh, from the hardened matrix. Now the material, the, the gray material that's surrounding this marble sculpture is fairly soft. It's volcanic ash that's been compacted. You could remove it with a trowel, but there's a lot of it, many meters thick. As they excavated further, they allowed this peplos bearing female sculpture uh, to come out of, the, uh, out of the volcanic fill that was holding her. Another sculpture taken from the same site is this marvelous Dionysus sculpture found in pieces and for some time the left side of it was undiscovered but eventually uh, that piece as well was found and this Dionysus holding a small panther cub and actually communicating eye-to-eye uh, -eye contact with that like talking panther cub. This remarkable sculpture was found at the same site. Also in recent years, an elaborate and gorgeous fresco or painted apsidal ceiling has been discovered with really beautiful wall paintings of Nereids uh, and other marine divinities. Our colleagues at the University of Tokyo have done fantastic work with this. This uh, art artist's rendering looks back towards that same point of view where we were looking at the the, the central doorway there was uh, where we were looking at the volcanic fill coming out 
as scholars have engaged this site more and more, uh, more things have come to light uh, and uh, fresh opinions have been found and formed about what was the, the layout, the nature, the decor, the purpose of this building. People are uh, more and more convinced that this really could be the house where Augustus perished. But it's also clear that the building is a centerpiece of a villa complex. This still photo, I'm gonna, I'm gonna leave it still here for this presentation, but invite you, if you're watching this later, to follow that, that link uh, that's at the base of the slide. These circular elements at the base of the building shown from the north east, so just there in the shadows. Those circular elements are what, what are known as dolia, large storage vessels for holding probably olive oil, large quantities of olive oil. I have a, uh, an image of a dolium that I'm going to show a little bit later on, but those are buried almost fully in the ground. The only reason why those would be at a house like this, at a villa of this nature, would be to hold oil or wine that was being produced. So all that's at Soma Vesuviana, this marvelous, elaborate villa that was destroyed by volcanic activity and uh, is still being studied now. The novelty of this slide is the blue dot a little bit to the uh, west and south of Soma Vesuviana, the blue dot of Polenotrochia, and I'd like to talk about that for a few minutes because Polenotrochia is the site of a, a second excavation uh, that has been going on in recent years on the north side of Vesuvius. This aerial photograph uh, shows, again, in the foreground, Monte Soma with a little bit of snow capping on the top, and then with clouds of ash spewing out the cone of Mount Vesuvius. You can see a state road going across, sort of cutting uh, diagonally a little bit to the lower right. Polenotrochia is along about the middle of that road in, uh, on, on the north side of Vesuvius. The town of Santa Anastasia is sort of anchoring the photograph on the left side over there. In the 17th century, there was a substantial eruption of Mount Vesuvius. There have been many. And this woodcut was produced at the time to commemorate the uh, eruption of Vesuvius, which did not destroy the population on the north side of the, of the volcano. You'll notice the familiar features, Monte Soma on the left and the cone of Vesuvius in the center with the volcanic activity going on. And then this figure, this human figure up above, the saintly figure with his ecclesiastical habits and things holding back the eruption of the, of the volcano. This is San Gennaro, a depiction of San Gennaro, the patron saint of Naples. Annually, there is a celebration of San Gennaro, which begins with a processional at the Duomo, the cathedral in Naples, where the presiding authority, ecclesiastical authority, whoever's presiding at this particular event in a given year, uh, sometimes the Pope is presided, will take a vial of blood that's kept in a reliquary at the Duomo and go in the processional over to the Church of Santa Chiara, which is uh, still within the, the Centro Storico of the city of Naples, and uh, preside over a ceremony which invokes uh, spiritual powers to liquefy the blood of San Gennaro, which is kept in this, in this sacred vial. Uh, when I witnessed this myself, I was not close enough to actually see the liquefaction of the blood, but there, there are people standing in close and they report out to the, the rest of the group whether or not the blood liquefies. San Gennaro was an ancient saint, an ancient individual, who was martyred for his Christian beliefs. And because he was faithful, he's, uh, according to stories, been sanctified, turned into a saint, and he 
fosters the interests uh, of the city of Naples. So the belief is that if the blood of San Gennaro in the annual ceremony fails to liquefy, that is bad news for, um, for the inhabitants of Naples. And in fact, superstition or belief aside, in 1989, a year that the blood of San Gennaro failed to liquefy in this ceremony, there was significant uh, seismic activity, bradicism, and a lot of destruction on the north side of the Bay of Naples out towards uh, beyond Pasilipo, and people were very disturbed by this. San Gennaro, according to legend and according to the belief of many, uh, continues to protect the, the inhabitants of Naples. And he's shown here in a depiction of the event, the volcanic event of 1635, holding back the fury of the volcano from the inhabitants of greater Naples, Soma Vesuviana, Polenotrochia, Nola, Napoli, and so on and so forth. It's an interesting phenomenon uh, to consider. This photograph, it's a fairly old photograph, shows uh, one of the churches in the town of Polenotrochia and looming above it, Monte Soma. This is another small church in the town of uh, Polenotrochia, where the sort of the central, the central spire there, tower, uh, and the doorway just down the little street, where for ages they have kept sacred this font for uh, sacred water, uh, for holy water that the, that the, the people who enter the church uh, can use. If you take the top of that font and turn it over, you can see more clearly, as in this image, uh, at the top, you can see that that is the, the base of an ancient column. In fact, there are many relics around in the region. This basin is repurposed from an old capital column uh, from antiquity. We call this phenomenon spoliation, where if you find some ancient uh, artifact, you might use it again and repurpose it. Spoliation is reusing old, uh, old artifacts. Another item that was found in the vicinity of Polenotrochia was this old dolium, an old uh, photograph from the 1940s here, something that a farmer took out of the ground. It's one of these receptacles uh, it's big enough that uh, a person my size could stand inside it, buried in the ground in its original intent for storage of oil, wine, grain, what, whatever needed to be stored. In the area of Polenotrochia, in the 1950s and 60s, when modern buildings were going up, workmen were finding things in the ground. So these two fellows here are taking a breather as they're creating the foundation for a building and they're digging around it. And all these pieces of terracotta at their feet are probably uh, amphorae that were repurposed in antiquity for uh, funerary purposes. Instead of a coffin, people would, would bury the remains of, of their dead inside these terracotta containers. And uh, this photograph is taken from the 60s, 1960s. If you look at the top, of course, the, the main feature is in the center and down below. But in the top, there is uh, visible a portion of a modern apartment building. Down at the base and in the foreground is this hole. Uh, this was known for a long time by local inhabitants in Polenotrochia. It is something from ages past. The way it became revealed was in the construction that was happening in this area, which was being done with backhoes and excavating machines. Those who were operating them came across this ancient building and actually broke away a portion of it before somebody made them stop. Uh, this happens all the time now in Naples, in Athens, in Rome, any city that's built on top of an ancient civilization has a hard time 
making a subway system because you keep running into ancient buildings that are under the modern ground. And that's what happened here. They weren't digging a subway. They were excavating to put up another apartment building, and they ran into an obstruction. Well, some study of that was done at the time, but then the site was backfilled in, and later was actually sort of repurposed in a perverse kind of way as uh, an illegal landfill. And when we came in, uh, in uh, 2004, 2005, the place had been used for a long time as illegal dumping for uh, building materials, lots of wire, pieces of rebar, uh, but lots and lots of disposed clothing that had been um, confiscated, maybe, um, and then dumped there illegally. And the place was overrun with weeds and terrible things. But under the ground, we knew there was some other ancient activity that, that had once been sort of spied, but never really studied and understood. For instance, this little apsidal room uh, was revealed and then covered back over. We know that in that sort of unofficial study of the place, this sculpture um, was discovered. An another uh, Dionysus or Bacchus holding a cluster of grapes in his left hand, attributes gone from his right hand. When Brigham Young University and Suorsala Benincasa University in Naples teamed up to study this site properly beginning in 2004, it was merely a site that looked like an open field. If you look at, at this image, you can see the apartment building that was shown before, sort of arching around on the right side, a high-rise apartment building, and then this field with a road cutting across diagonally on the left side. The yellow markings, the black markings, those are drawn on to indicate where we were going to do GPR, or ground penetrating radar, uh, investigations. But it turns out we didn't really need to do ground penetrating radar to find the site. What we really needed was people to start digging in the ground. So with the appropriate archaeological supervision and following archaeological technique, a group of students and a couple of faculty members teamed up with colleagues uh, in Naples, archaeologically trained colleagues, Antonio de Simone, his son uh, Ferdinando de Simone, and we started excavating this place, which took a while. The first year, the people shown in the upper left are standing in the entirety of the site. At the end of the second year, uh, we had begun to discover things in the ground, and at the end of the second year, in fact, we discovered a burial that was datable. The group has grown over the years. This was a, a picture taken in 2005. Aside from Ferdinando de Simone, this is the group, all students from Brigham Young University who participated in uh, the initial opening of the site. This picture was taken a few years ago now, uh, in 2013. The, the team that was excavating uh, the site at Polenotrochia, I'm proud of the fact that the guy in the center in the back wearing a white t-shirt has a Y on it, which doesn't stand for Yale. It's Brigham Young University. Um, even though uh, at this point, BYU had officially, formally withdrawn from the activities of the site, we're still in connection, social, amicable connection with the, with the project, which we call the Apolina Project. Uh, this is what the site looks like these days. What we've discovered over the years is that this is an ancient villa as well. It has a bath complex attached to it. And there are elements of hypocaust floors, these stacks of tiles upon which a floor was elevated where heat could be pumped in underneath to warm the place up. There are vaulted rooms and so forth. What we have here is a villa that was constructed on top of the ashes of the 79 AD eruption. It's a, it's a villa that is at least uh, from the first century AD and probably from the second and third century AD, uh, erected on top of this cultural context where the villa 
postdates the eruption of Vesuvius. Uh, at the base of some of the walls, the interior walls, we found painted stucco that indicates that maybe there were some walls that were, that were present as early as 79 AD, but the, the villa itself is of later construction, later than the uh, Vesuvian eruption. Since the excavation has gone on for several years, we, we collectively have reached the point where we're uh, studying rather than digging uh, further. I'm actually gonna skip a couple of slides ahead uh, to this one, a publication in 2009 uh, by my colleague, I called him Ferdinando, it's Girolamo Ferdinando de Simone and myself, uh, which we co-edited called the Apollina Project, Studies on Vesuvius's North Slope and the Bay of Naples. We published this in 2009, it's a collection of essays where we're contributing, but then other scholars uh, are contributing as well for a sort of omnibus approach to understanding what's going on on the north slope of Vesuvius. Our finding has been that when the volcano erupted in 79 AD, um, it destroyed, famously, civilization in Pompeii and Herculaneum and covered it over. But on the north slope of the volcano, things were spared, uh, culture was spared to a large extent. I think it, it probably took more cleaning up than just pulling out the broom the next day and sweeping up. Um, but life went on on the north slope of Vesuvius um, in a very real way. Um, culture was not interrupted. Uh, uh, the economy was slowed for a while, but not devastated, uh, not set back to the dark ages, as it were. Um, and life went on. We know volcanically, geologically, uh, that there was a series of eruptions at, uh, at Vesuvius beginning in 472 AD and continuing through about 512 AD. Now, historically, those dates are significant. We like to date, sort of for a matter of convenience, the, the end of the Roman Empire as 476 AD. 472, the first of the eruptions on the north side of Vesuvius, um, 472 is right before that date. And in fact, uh, the first burial that we, uh, that we uncovered in the excavation supports that date. There was a coin found in with it. So it's our belief that life went on, uh, slowed but not devastated, uh, and the economy on the north side of Vesuvius uh, continued. I'll, sl I'll skip to this slide, which has publication details of a book, or sorry, of a, of a journal article published a few years ago by Emilia Alevato and others called The Persistence of the Cultural Landscape in Campania Before the AD 472 Vesuvius Eruption, Archaeo-Environmental Data. And just quoting from the article, a couple of things. This presents new data from two sites located on the northern slope of Vesuvius, both of them buried by the AD 472 eruption. They've been investigated here. The two sites are the villa, so-called Villa of Augustus at Soma Vesuviana and this other villa, which I guess I haven't formally named. The, the plot of land is called the Masseria de Carolis and it's in the town of Polenotrochia um, on the north side of Vesuvius. So these two sites, Soma Vesuviana and Polenotrochia, Masseria de Carolis, buried in the 472 eruption, they're, they're now being uh, thoroughly scientifically uh, reinvestigated. Uh, back to the article, using charcoal analysis, carbon-14 dating, chemical analysis of organic residues and so forth. Scholars are now studying the landscape and the food production associated with these villas. Results suggest, this is quoting from the article, uh, the persistence of the Roman cultural landscape until the fourth and fifth centuries in this area. The landscape is in fact strongly marked both in agricultural and woodland exploitation and management being characterized by managed chestnut forests as well as valuable cultivations of walnut, large vineyards, olive groves, 
and probably orchards and crops. Shown on that slide, in, on the left side, is a floor plan of the villa at Soma Vesuviana. And then finally, I'd like to call attention to a recently published article published in March of 2020 by Ferdinando de Simone and colleagues, Dr. Marucci and Dr. Castaldo, called Produzione e Circolazione Ceramica in Aria Vesuviana, Production and, Circul and Ceramic Circulation, the ceramic trade in the Vesuvian region, the villa with baths at Polenotrochia. That's the title of the article, focusing especially on the ceramic remains that have come from the villa at Polenotrochia. Let me conclude with something that I, I, I might have said earlier but didn't. Um, the, uh, uh, the livelihood of this town, Polenotrochia, has been curbed in recent years. Uh, I'm, I'm not speaking politically, I'm, try I'm trying to speak matter-of-factly. Uh, because Polenotrochia is so close to uh, the top of Vesuvius, or the business part of Vesuvius, if you will, um, the European Union and civil defense uh, authorities have demarcated that area around, uh, especially on the north side, as a red zone where um, economic development is not allowed. And uh, we were approached several years ago by the local uh, administrators in Polenotrochia, uh, the town council, approached and said, there's this archaeological site. Would you like to investigate it more closely? So teaming up, as I did say before, uh, with colleagues at Suarez Le Benincasa um, and Federico Secondo University in, in Naples, uh, Brigham Young University went in together and uh, started this archaeological project. We're quite proud of the, uh, of the results, but we're also proud of the, of the interest that's helped generate for the town of Polenotrochia. There is some building that continues to go there uh, in, in the red zone, but it's greatly curbed by, uh, uh, by, by local laws primarily to protect the inhabitants from future eruptions of the volcano. But there's this interesting site, interesting pair of sites on the north side of Vesuvius that I'd like to encourage anybody who goes to the area to look into and, uh, and investigate. It's hard to get into the Soma Vesuviana site uh, because it's behind lock and key and protected by this marvelous um, uh, shelter over the top but there's interesting activity going on there. Uh, Polenotrochia, the site is visible from the road and, uh, and it's fascinating and will uh, we'll be producing material for scholarly study and also, let's hope, uh, material for further archeological development uh, in the next years on the north side or the dark side of Vesuvius. Thank you. <laughs>